I'm Christine Russo, and welcome to What Just Happened. Today, we welcome Kara Smith, Global Senior Managing Director, ESG, Responsible Retail at Accenture. Welcome, Kara. So nice to meet you, Christine. So brief intro. Uh, my name is Kara Smith, and I am a Senior Managing Director at Accenture and lead our Global Sustainability slash Environmental, Social, and Governance, or ESG, practice for retail specifically. Having grown up in the industry, I spent a long time coming up on four years at Accenture, but spent a long time specifically in the apparel sector of retail. Uh, growing up, I would say growing the income and image of a lot of big brands like Hugo Boss, Jill Sander, Burberry, and so on. And about 10 years or so, passing on 10 years along the time of around the time of the Rana Plaza factory collapse. I realized the industry could kind of be unleashed maybe in another way if there was different levels of collaboration across environmental and social issues, keeping profitability squarely in mind um, because only profitable companies become part of these solutions and um, created something which is inside Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors now called Fashion Makes Change. And that convenes uh, over 55 CEOs, 275 brands, their company liaisons, also nonprofits in that space as well, and uh, joined Accenture, as I said, because criticality of nonprofits, academia, and that world externally is of the highest order. Trying to get things done, very important to have a company like Accenture that really lands teams, understands the data, the technology, supply chain, and so on. So we're a little bit of a nonprofit hat along with my Accenture role, but they work very, very well together in trying to solve sustainability issues. Got it. I love the phrase responsible retail that you use in, in your dialogue. Can we talk a little bit about that? That's an unfamiliar word, but I find it to be really fresh, a fresh perspective. It actually puts the onus on the retailer uh, because it very clearly says, you know, this is your, this is your carrying card. So give me some history on that or thought process. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually um, a term I think that was coined by the um, Jill Standish, who leads retail at Accenture. And this idea of how are we reshaping the future through this lens of responsibility in all different ways, I think it's quite interesting because if we're all sort of tasked and think about the whole world is a community and we should be a community of change makers looking at what things that are happening at the, in the world that we wish are happening differently. How do you turn that community of change makers into something practical in business and unleash businesses ability to do good. And so I think if you want to think about what does sourcing and procurement look like in a responsible manner. I could be saying, you know, what materials am I looking at? Is regenerative agriculture involved? What certified materials are there? If I'm thinking about responsible retail and it's in the design phase, I might be saying as a designer, I'm going to design in a more modularized way so that I can think of circularity, end of use, end of life from the get-go. If I know it's easier to take this product apart and value its parts and keep them in the resale market, what does that look like? Or am I thinking about durability there? If I think of a responsible supply chain for responsible retail, quite interesting now because I think as people commit to ESG goals or science-based targets, retail recognizes 75, even up to 90% of their impacts are happening in the supply chain or as for a retailer with their brand partners. So suddenly there's a whole new level of engaging with each other using both the lens of operating efficiencies and ESG benefit for sort of a, a positive, a double whammy or part of positive co-benefit there in supply chain. So you can almost take this responsible retail lens and run straight down from design to procurement, to merchandising, to supply chain, to even finance, how are they reporting things out? Uh, how are we looking at data and technology through this responsible lens to allow consumers to shop according to their value? So you can unpack each step along retail's value chain and put a responsible lens on it. And I think you'll come up maybe with a slightly different answer than you would if you were only looking at the economics of the business. There is a lot of chatter around that. It's just not called responsible retail. 
which it sounds more like sustainable retail. To me, responsible retail has a human component and a human commitment. And does it include that? Yes, for sure. It's interesting because I think, you know, the sustainable word, I'm a sustainability nerd for sure. But this idea of the word sustainable, more and more you're hearing, you know, should it be regenerative? Should it be a net positive business? Because sustaining what we're doing isn't good enough. And so I think, you know, some people like ESG, some people like corporate social responsibility. There's all different names. But I think if you, what I like about ESG is it buckets what it is that's on everybody's to-do list. If I'm thinking about the environmental side, I'm worried about climate, I'm worried about water, I'm worried about chemicals. If I'm thinking about the S, then I'm worried about fair wages, worker conditions, upskilling workers as technology comes on stream. If I think of the G in governance, then I need, need that traceability, transparency, the data recording and so on. So I like that framing. And it takes it kind of above sustainable and responsible. And I always think there's a risk in the sustainability world of drifting away from profitability. And I think it's to be called out because you're running a profitable business, it shouldn't be kind of shame on you. A profitable business that's doing so in a mindful and responsible way, you have a responsibility to your shareholders, just like you have a responsibility to all of the people in your value chain to deliver both positive financial impact, but positive sustainability, social and environmental aspects as well. I'm sure you are aware about the backlash against the letters ESG. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and your team ESG, and I am too, but you know, from 2021 and on, it became, you know, a dirty word. The work is still happening, I think. It's called other things. It's positioned as other things. How, do, how does that show up in your day-to-day? -day? You're very clear about that that's the objectives, but people don't want to touch that anymore. To me, I think the politics should be out of this issue. What we're really talking about, you know, if you look at the original definition of sustainability from the United Nations, it was something loosely like, you know, leading lives today without sacrificing the future of the next generations to lead theirs in the way that they want to kind of a thing. So this generation shouldn't cause sacrifices for the next. And I don't think that there's anybody around the world that would say, I take issue with that. We all either have children or no children. So to say, you know, we can be so selfish and do anything that we want now and not worry about the future of the world or our children, kind of a difficult argument to make. So it used to be corporate social responsibility. Is it sustainability? Is it regeneration? Is it ecological and economic benefit? I'm sure the names will continue to shift. Regardless, I think if you can do it better, why wouldn't you? So doing it better means how do you chase the waste out of your system? And regardless of where anybody stands, if you would say, I could use less material, less food, less gasoline, less energy. I could use less touch points in my warehouse. I could use less, you know, less, less, less of everything along the way. You will become a more profitable company. You will find operating efficiencies. So regardless of where you stand in the world of, it should only be worried about profits or I wanna be worried about profitability and sustainability, chasing the waste out of the system delivers the benefits of um, being more frugal with what we have. And I think then again, you can come to common ground with people that everybody agrees on those things. So that leads me to my next question, which you sort of yeah. answered, but let's spend a minute yeah. or two on it, which is, these are theories, these are points of view, these are strategies, but how does it show up? I'm in a boardroom at a retailer. How is it showing up? But how, not just how does it show up, like how does Accenture, uh, help them and guide them? And what is a tactical piece of, of something that might be? So I think that's really interesting. I think it depends, you know, you always hear about somebody's sustainability journey, like we are, because we have people that are super mature on their sustainability roadmap and achieving their goals and others that are saying, uh oh, compliance and regulations are coming down the path. So I need to get my data ducks in a row in shorthand. So I think that depends, but I think e regardless of how mature or immature, 
uh, a client or a partner may be. We're finding people now looking at the regulatory landscape because that has shifted and is shifting. I mean, the amount of data that you will need for things like extended producer's responsibility, um, whether that be on plastics or product labeling or the double materiality, which is now how is the environmental or the climate issues affecting my company, but how is my company affecting the climate? So now folks are standing in the middle and have to worry about that in both directions. And not only they have to not just report on it, but they also have to be able to remediate. And I think that becomes quite interesting. So a refresh of do I have the right sustainability goals in place now? We're coming up on 2025. So we see the client saying, do I have all of the initiatives in place to hit 2025? How am I starting to shift my view even out to 2030? And I would say unpacking goal by goal by goal. How close am I to that? Do I have the right data either to say I made it or I didn't make it, but this is how I was trying to achieve my goals is critical. Refreshing those goals based on the regulatory landscape for traceability, transparency, standard producers responsibility, CSRD, all of that that we know is coming over the next years is a big part of it. Do I have the right goals? What am I doing about them? But I think a big shift now is the data landscape. So it used to be only reporting but now that we're seeing again with CSRD, CS Triple D, all of the regulations coming out of Europe, this idea of what would happen if I wanted to raise the level of my data to reasonable data assurance, meaning, you know, what if I was audited on my sustainability data? Am I sure where my original goal came from? Am I sure how that got baselined? Am I sure of the data that's coming through each of the different verticals of my company, like we talked about before, the merchants, the designers, is everybody clear on what we have to do as a team? We always say sustainability is a team sport at Accenture. So understanding that everybody has to have their role in order to achieve the sustainability goals is also critical. And what's the data that has to be coming up through each vertical on what piece of the sustainability puzzle there may be marching forward. So I think that goal by goal review, are they the right goals? Where is the data? Do we have the initiatives in place to achieve them? And even some shifts in operating models is quite interesting. When I started, there was a sustainability team separate and apart from the business. And it's not that they're not still there, but there is no sustainability team in the world that manages procurement, nor warehouses, nor supply chains. So they are setting the agenda. They are managing the regulatory environment, even investor relations on sustainability and questions that are there. But they're not actually handling the change management across the business to understand now, what is it that the designers have to be doing differently? And how do they enact, again, across the value chain, all of those decisions? So very often, this idea of, I like to think of a bit like a jigsaw puzzle. If there was a jigsaw puzzle that made up the sustainability, science-based target, environmental, and social agenda of a company, who has to have what piece of that puzzle to be running that up the field, collecting the data, doing it with their teams, and then putting those puzzle pieces back together to be able to tell your sustainability story? And do you have the data that will evidence each one of those pieces is another big C-suite conversation, board conversation. Where are we going? Do we have the evidence to achieve what it is that we promise to achieve? And I'll give you one more that I think is critical. And that's supplier engagement. So this idea that, as I mentioned before, 75 to 90 percent of retail's impacts are out in the supply chain, putting this responsible retail lens on means I need to be talking to my suppliers about what are their goals? Do my goals and their goals match? What about the suppliers suppliers? So how do we start to exchange and move data and information back and forth along the supply chain? to evidence the progress in a concrete way and create that agenda of progress throughout the, your community of suppliers. Because otherwise, if I'm at the top of the food chain, so to speak, and I'm a retailer, I can't actually move my numbers unless my suppliers and brands are. And then how am I getting that data of what they've changed about their practices and products? So I think there's like a bifurcation going on because we have this reg, um, regulation coming and we have the discussions and actions now we're in action phase now the discussions were 
year, year and a half ago, two years ago. And now they're in the activation phase because in order to make the date for the uh, regulation, you have to be active, activating or close to activating now, vetting and activating. And yet there's other brands that are just like, la, 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 what regulation? So we, how, in your view, how will small brands fare? And then there's offenders. How will they fare? The small brands are not necessarily offenders. You could have big brands that are offenders. So where do you want to where do you want to comment on that? Um, so I think the big brands are better prepared because this is not a surprise that it's been coming. You know, when I got into the space ten years ago, this idea of um, there are there's a collision of stakeholder priorities where regulatory regulations were known to be coming on stream investors are asking more questions about it because of operating efficiencies weather events you know we see how costly these things are so it's not necessarily that all of the investors have turned into like peace and love and green people but they see very well that esg has a materiality there's risks to the business so they're interested in it consumers i think are more and more interested in it more from getting it wrong. You know, if you're doing something wrongly, I think consumers are interested. I'm not sure every consumer is asking questions about their products when they're shopping yet, but the say do gap is closing, is closing. And I think even the companies themselves are recognizing the idea to be more profitable as they chase the waste out of the system and de-risk ensuring that they're doing right on the social side. So I think larger companies are already on the path. They've committed to science-based targets. They have publicly facing ESG goals. They have teams. They've started this idea of data and ops models. So who was perhaps a larger offender because of the size of the business in the past is already on the path to remediation and change. I think that will be quite interesting for the vendor base again, because of all of the new conversations that are happening of, we need to resolve this together. There's new levels of community of collaboration because it's like a rugby scrum, like we're all stuck with our arms locked together and we need to walk forward. I think two things on the smaller companies, it's easier and you're more agile and flexible if you are a smaller company to watch lessons learned by the bigger companies. We put out a report every year, Scaling Sustainability Solutions in collaboration with Women's Wear Daily. It's the third annual edition that's specifically for retail, but we do this across the retail patch, have similar ideas of where should I be going now? What are the lessons learned? Who's already done proof of concepts? Where is there already alignment, whether it be on educating women in the supply chain or on what are the chemicals that are hazardous in the supply chain or on food waste or plastics coalitions? So you can learn a lot and lift and shift but from the ones that have gone before as a smaller company. I do think if I think of suppliers, there's some risk there for smaller companies because if you are less able to be compliant or less fluent in what the suppliers will need, I think there's a risk that bigger companies will be aggregating around a supply base that is able to manage the needs and the requirements and that data exchange. And that then maybe also means bigger vendors, already more professionalized, so when it comes to small, I don't know if we were talking about brands and sort of startups or smaller suppliers, I think there's some risk for smaller suppliers that they're going to have to professionalize and have a sustainability fluency, maybe faster than they're ready to have that could put them at a certain disadvantage. I am, I do want to spend a minute talking about like the direct to consumer who I would consider smaller brands. And I think what you're saying is they have the risk of being squeezed out of some of the most compliant suppliers by the big guys. But will people be watching them? Will it sort of, will we'll get to those businesses to see if they're compliant? And I don't even know what remediation is. Like what, what goes on? There's like a policeman, a sustainability, like is it up through the federal government? Are they staffed for that? What, what is the monitoring that's going to come in place for the regulation? We're in the messy middle, I like to say. It's not really clear yet. As the regulations are coming on stream, I think there's a lot of concerns by various brands, whether it be in the, you know, the grocery space or fashion space. What is the evidence base that the regulatory environment will require for me to prove 
that I'm doing the right thing. And I don't think that's perfectly clear yet. You know, if you're thinking of where am I producing or how am I, what is the evidence of labor conditions or even on, you know, more of the environmental side, how do I prove this was organic or regenerative ag? So I think there's still a lot to come as the regulations become clear. But the governments are moving, even we see securities and exchange commissions, you know, still the final word hasn't come down, but they're asking the questions. And in a way, this feels like the readiness phase that we have all of the bigger brands and retailers saying, we know that we're going to have to have more transparent labeling. We know I can already be fined because I have the extended producer's responsibility for plastics in certain states. We know that there will be product labeling. So they're unpacking. We know that I'm going to have to demonstrate this remediation for my numbers. If my reporting shows here are my impacts and I'm going to have to then say, what am I doing to alleviate those impacts or eventually I will incur fines. Now, this is why I think there's sort of a bubbling up and such a catalyzing of, I need to run that responsible business, but back to the operating model, who has to be doing what in my value chain, who's gonna be reporting it. And one of the things I think that is most interesting that's coming out of that is sort of a forced collaboration in a good way. So uh, we even saw it at Accenture, which I sometimes consider when we're helping clients, I love it because it's like a fantasy football team. If a client approaches and says to us, we wanna work on our data, it might come in the sustainability door at Accenture that they'll be asking us to help them with regulations, their goals, do they have the right goals and so on. But very quickly it becomes, we're going to wanna report this. So my CFO, wants a seat at the table. So suddenly it's sustainability people and the financial people because they will be reporting maybe in their 10K or in other places, the results also on sustainability. Quickly then they say, what IT systems do we have in place? Are we running a system for plastics? Are we running something to calculate all of our energy usage or which, you know, where do we have green energy? Do we have digital twins to improve factories? Okay. Oh, then, you know, so you can go down and along and say what IT systems are necessary. If you're a global company, you might have a regional IT system and a global IT system. How am I scraping all of my data together? So now you have sustainability people at the table, financial people at the table, and then you have the data and technology people at the table. Next up is, ooh, we're going to have to change the way we operate. I need the business people at the table now. How are we calculating food waste? Or how are we buying more sustainable fashion products? Or how are we ensuring we're reducing pa pa packaging in CPG, for example? Now you've got the business people at the table. And then also you'll think about, oh, well, we'll maybe have process and controls and the risks teams. So suddenly this fantasy football of who do I need on the team to think about how do we actually shift towards responsible business over the years has changed even the way Accenture helps clients because you need different competency areas to talk to the different competency areas on the opposite side, which would be on the client side. And very often on the client side, it's like five people with five different priorities, maybe five different KPIs, their bonuses and performance management might be tied to five different things. And it's like five different languages are being spoken. So you need almost, almost this like control tower and community of change makers together to understand how do we actually work? How do we blend the KPIs, achieve the goals of the company, unleashing department by department or vertical by vertical and better aligning everybody's end priorities to ensure achievement of those goals and again that wider shift back to this idea of responsible business i i understand that do you think you're for the larger brands the global brands the, europe is way ahead of us and they're just sort of like going to press rinse and repeat when things kind of happen here because what we're doing is maybe even smaller from a requirement standpoint so they're really kind of like getting all of the work done for global international eu and then we'll be in such a good position for the us thoughts on that yes so my answer is short answer is yes i think europe is ahead of us also because they're being forced by the regulatory environment I think anyway, you know, maybe 
could think about the north of Europe, some lifestyle. I lived in Italy for a long time. I was always eating what was grown at the time, you know, so it was sort of the way life worked. So I do think in various places in Europe, there's a bit more consciousness and mindfulness around whether it be food or fashion or whatever it is, longer term, higher in fashion, the north of Europe, the way that they live. So there's something maybe more in their culture on it, but I do think the clarity, although it's still all taking form, of at least the anticipated regulatory environment was unleashed earlier than it was here. California coming out of the gate, certain states on other things here, SEC may. I think our politics might slow us down a little bit because there are differing opinions. Is it a woke agenda? What kind of agenda is it? And so on. So I, I think yes. However, most of the larger companies and the ones that we're working with regularly recognize all boats will have to rise to the highest level. And that will be for the moment Europe. You know, you're never going to say, oh, this blouse or this grocery item works in Maine, but it doesn't work in Iowa. Or this shirt I can only sell in the States because of chemicals or something that's in it and I can't sell it in Europe. Or, you know, even in if you think of fast food and chemicals that are allowed in food here that are not allowed in food there, it becomes more and more difficult to manage it singularly, whether it be state by state or region by region, than it does to say we have a better baseline of products. So I am hoping the European pressure will catalyze the change all over the world, even though we have probably a longer time run in some ways. I mean, California is kind of taking a role there, but I do think that we'll, Europe will force it to your point. Yes. Understand. Okay. So one more discussion point. Please. Let's get into the fashion convener report that was recently dispersed. I'd love your thoughts on that. Yes. Fantastic. So I, I think there is in general, if I confess, being one of the people in this movement, frustration by the sustainability community in general, broadly, by the lack of scale, by the lack of speed, by the lack of resources, by thousands and thousands of proofs of concept and a lack of alignment on, are we really moving the needle? I think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, I feel equally heartened as I do frightened about what there is to do. If I think of 10 years ago in the space to where we are now, it's a common topic. It's part of a business agenda. It's central to businesses' agendas, sustainability. However, if I would say, oh, like point to the big successes, point to the big changes, there are some. But I think there's still a frustration of multi-stakeholder initiatives not being as effective as they could and should be. So a couple of things happening. One, I'm going to take us first back to our scaling sustainability solutions and ESG solutions. We've identified the 12 key areas that companies need to work on. We're starting to scrape together common definitions, common KPIs. What are the goals we're all trying to achieve? Because already, if we don't all know where we're headed, it's very difficult to measure ourselves against it. And there's been a lack of common goals sector by sector across retail. We met, work with a lot of CEOs, C-suites, and often what we find and how Fashion Conveners was born was one of the CEOs that's kind of funny that we work with said, interesting how well the for-profit community can collaborate and come together to solve problems, but the non-profit community cannot. It's fragmented, it's difficult. They're all competing for brand attention. There's too many of them talking to two food people on our team. We need team captains per issue area so that we can understand how do we best align. Couldn't there be a convening of the conveners? Who's best in the space, for example, on chemicals? Can they help convene all of the other nonprofits in that space so we have a more collaborative agenda? What happens on materials, regenerative agriculture, and so on? Who's in that space? Who's in maybe the women's education and empowerment space, industry by industry? So that's how fashion conveners got formed. They are the team captains in the space that are helping to align the agenda of where is their expertise when they are the strongest. I would point to a textile exchange and AII working on mill improvement, ZDHC on chemicals. 
So the fashion conveners have been collaborating over the last years to understand how can the nonprofit community work better together to accelerate and support the industry leaders as they're trying to move their sustainability agenda through their own companies when they're still trying to run those companies. I don't think the nonprofits facilitate, and I'm one of them, you know, I have one, so I'm not throwing shade at others without throwing shade at myself. In order to facilitate the change, we need to do it in business language, aligned with the operating units across those companies, giving clearer opportunities and guidelines and frameworks for scale because we're better organized on the outside having worked with each other. So I love the fashion conveners report because we're beginning to demonstrate how does that nonprofit community support and assist and facilitate the changes that we are all expecting and calling for in the for-profit community. I did have a question. You hit on two things without me asking. The first was this question, which is, how do you feel about this, the state of the state? And you answered it in the context of the fashion conveners, which is you're excited and also scared to death. And I think that that's very important to have that because I do speak to sustainability people and they're either angry and frustrated and like losing their minds or they're like, it's great. And I'm like, you can't possibly think it's great. Yeah. The and listen, I think, you know, the sustainability people, again, I'm one of them, have to be mindful of the language we use. Uh, I was actually teaching, a, I was doing a guest lecture with students and I said, watch your language, please, to them, which you know, got all of the students laughing. But the reality is, if I approach a company still today, when there is more fluency on sustainability and say, you have a carbon footprint, oh, there's overconsumption and overproduction, so you should slow down your production, you should advertise less, shame on you, shame on you, shame on you. I don't think we're necessarily facilitating change. We're often accusing and highlighting the issue areas, but we're not aligning it with the value chain. And this is back to sort of the operating model that I was talking about, we're working on a lot. If I'm a designer and somebody says to me, we could sell that same product that you're designing three times because we're going to sell it first and then we're going to repair it and we're going to sell it again another time and then we're maybe going to take apart the components and sell those pieces again if you're designing it effectively suddenly the price of that garment i think about that differently so i can't lead with a you should be circular foot and think somebody on the other end is going to understand that i need to be saying Let's think about how you're designing into multiple sales of that product. Do you need more durable materials, whether that be wood for furniture or whether that be, you know, what, whatever the materials might be. Think about how are we going to take that apart and or recycle it and or reuse it and or repair it or refurbish it. Or when we can't do any of those things, what do I have left that still brings value and how do I get that? It's a new, completely new approach. So if we keep saying, shame on you, I want to talk to you about the impacts rather than aligning with business language and then saying they don't move fast enough, well, maybe we're not facilitating in the way that we need to be. And this is why I think, you know, if I look again at the way that Accenture works, they've always been doing supply chain optimization, data transfer. It's what we always did. Now this, you know, let me have an efficiency in a business and a marketing lens and let me have a sustainability lens when I'm looking through my glasses at the problem in a different way. It forces innovation. Otherwise, we're just doing less worse in very bad language. You know, we're we're raking the leaves and doing a little better and clustering up the problems. We're not reimagining the healthy future and building that. You know, I'm part of a systems change group which is super interesting and it's always like are you looking at the old system trying to fix it or are you actually looking towards the future and say let me not be wholly and only informed by what exists but if we're going to interrupt that and reinvent it what has to happen and then where's the bridge between what the old is and what the new is and that's very different maybe than the nonprofit world often has the capability to do and guide. That takes 
a bridge into a company like Accenture that can land a team and untangle it because they understand all of the business opportunities and issues, not just the sustainability impacts that we're trying to reduce. I hope I was clear there. Very. I I don't mean to simplify it, but that's actually one of my biggest strengths, try to summarize a point into under five words. But what you're describing is iteration versus innovation, and there's a lot of iteration, and it's just not going to make a difference. Totally. And this is, I think, the, the um, exhaustion in the sustainability community is coming from, I'm working so hard to make change. And in this season of scale that's necessary, what's working? And so, I don't know, you know, maybe it's because I'm on, you know, just past my 10 year anniversary in the space that I did a lot of thinking of what the, what does it look like over the next 10 years? What impact, like, where can I, I mean, I'm certainly not solving it by myself. So, you know, where does every individual, where's your, um, what are the levers that I have in my world? And that's quite interesting to look at the supply chain technology companies that are embedding sustainability now. So that can help at scale to make different decisions, because if I have visibility, not just for reporting, but into the consideration set of sustainability, as I'm looking at supply chain optimization, very interesting. You know, if we're looking at what initiatives have been piloted, where should we ask the industry to pile in? What does that look like? We're, we're in a different time. It feels maybe, and maybe my selfish view of 10 years in, what do I want the next 10 years to look like? Or what do I think the next 10 years can look like in a reassessment there? Maybe it's also the 2025, you know, there's some of these natural times that are coming up, but I feel like we're coming onto a completely new place in the way we're approaching sustainability because of data technology regulations, Gen AI and all of the rest of it that we'll, mutate the landscape completely from where we are. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank you for your time, Kara Smith from Accenture. Great to be with you. Thank you for having me. i um, delighted to be here and appreciate all of your focus on the subject. Your insights are incredible, actually. I'm excited for people to hear about them. And your thoughtfulness in this space is, is quite apparent, and we're better off for it. Well, thank you. Thank you. Very kind of you. And thank you for pushing out the messages. So it's equally okay. critical. We're all in it together here. My pleasure. I'm Christine Russo. Thank you for listening to What Just Happened.